Hello and welcome to my Commodore PC-22, a beautiful XT compatible PC from Commodore. Oh, that doesn't sound good. Now most of you probably know that this is not what a hard drive is supposed to sound like. But I would like to take this opportunity to show you around the machine and see what it can do. Now starting around 1984, Commodore decided it would be a good idea to go into the PC market. And you had a lot of IBM PC XT compatible clones flooding the market. And this PC had everything that you would expect from a PC clone. It had the five and a quarter inch floppy drive, room for a hard drive. It had a full size keyboard. And it also had room for lots of expansion cards. So you could add functionality to the computer. It came with a 170 watt power supply capable of running things like floppy drives and hard drives. It had a serial and a parallel port and it had sufficient room for up to five expansion cards. It had a full size keyboard, a bit like the original IBM XT keyboard, but not exactly the same quality. It has a standard XT class connector and it connects to the front of the PC like this. It came with a 13 inch monochrome green phosphor monitor and the big PC case itself. Now this Commodore 76 BM13 monitor is a 13 inch monochrome green phosphor monitor capable of doing MDA and Hercules. It was released in 1985 for a number of Commodore PCs including the PC10 and this PC20. And it came with this female 6-pin DIN connector that would be converted to a standard D sub connector for the video card. On the back it also had various knobs to set the screen height and the screen width of the monitor. But of course as I was preparing for this video during shooting this power switch knob decided to fail on me. Of all things. So it was time to open up the PC anyway, see what's inside and see what we can do about the power supply. So inside it was really dirty, lots of dust, but it had the usual suspects inside of it. Now the power unit was running very hot as well as a hard drive. But let's take a look at the power supply. So we're going to be unscrewing it from the case so that we can open her up and see what's wrong with the switch. Now the PC comes with this proprietary uh, power connector on the main board, something which is specific to Commodore PCs. So we can take the power supply out and let's open her up. It has a fan. I don't think that the fan is running. So we'll also need to look at that. But our primary concern right now is the fact that we cannot turn on the PC anymore because the power switch is completely stuck and doesn't want to switch on the computer. Let's open her up and see what we can do. Now I didn't have a replacement switch for this one so I just decided to unplug these two power cords and just uh, solder them together so that the PC would always be on as soon as a power cable is hooked up to the power supply. So this is a temporary measure but like I said I didn't have a power switch to replace it with. I am going to be looking for one but this will have to do for now. So I'm just going to be checking the power supply if it puts out the correct voltages, which it does. So here's the 12 volt line and here is the 5 volt line. I did notice, however, that the fan is not working, so we'll need to address that also. Let's start by taking everything out of the PC, starting with this video card, this ATI CW16800 video card, which is an MDA Hercules compatible card that we'll look into more detail later. Next up is the hard drive controller. So this is a typical Western digital MFM hard drive controller. We'll be discussing it in more detail later on, uh, go over the various configurations and jumper settings. But this is used to hook up the 20 megabyte hard drive, which is in this PC. 
Next up, we also have this little weird card, which is the RAM expansion card. So this computer comes with 640 kilobytes of RAM, 256 is on the main board, and the rest is on this little expansion card, which uses this proprietary Commodore connector to attach it to the main board. Next up, we'll be unscrewing the hard drive to get it out because there are some issues with this, as you probably heard at the beginning of this video. So let's take it out. It's a rather big MFM hard drive. This is the connector for the LED, which is on the front of the case. And we also have the five and a quarter inch floppy drive. So let's get it out of the case just by unscrewing a couple of screws here. It will require some cleaning. There's a lot of dust on it, um, but the drive seems to be working fine. So this is, yeah, your typical Chinon or Chinon based uh, floppy disk drive. This is a 1.2 megabyte drive, which is nice. Now this floppy drive is connected to the main board directly. So the floppy drive controller is in fact located on the main board. So we don't lose an expansion slot for the floppy drive. So that's nice. Something you see in a lot of Commodore PCs. Let's get the power supply out again so that we can uh, get a good look at the case and clean everything and get the motherboard out. So here again, we have the proprietary power supply connector which is located on the main board a six pin connector here we have the parallel or the serial port connector which is also located on the main board so again there is no additional io card required for that here we have the pc speaker and the power led connector we also have the keyboard connector which is located on the pc uh, and to get uh, the main board out, we just need to unscrew these two screws here. And the rest is just uh, sliding over these plastic standoffs and sliding it out of the case like this. Now the case is full of dust. It's a little bit dirty, so I'm going to be uh, cleaning it now that I have a completely empty case, which will make the job a lot easier and here we have it all of the components that make up our commodore pc22 so we obviously have the main board which has a lot of integrated stuff on it as we will see later on we have the big mfm hard drive from basf we have the five and a quarter inch floppy drive, 1.2 megs from China. We have the power supply unit, 170 watts. We have the RAM expansion card, a hard drive controller card, and a video card. So that's basically it, not a whole lot of component. The funny thing is, is that this uh, MFM hard drive, which is completely internal, has this front bezel or cover, which is totally not visible. Perhaps this was an, uh, something that they put in afterwards. I don't know if it's stock for Commodore PCs to use this kind of BASF hard drive, but yeah. We have the main board and there are in fact, there are only two expansion cards here, which is the video card and the uh, hard drive controller card. The memory expansion card doesn't take up an ISA slot because it uses this proprietary connector from Commodore. So you get a lot of, um, you actually get three free ISA slots that you can use on this board. Now the main board itself comes equipped with 256 kilobytes of memory in the form of these eight Oki chips on the main board, including one additional chip for parity. And the rest is offered by the expansion card. Here we have the two uh, BIOS chips of this PC. The Intel 8088 clocked at 4.7 megahertz. A six pin connector to provide power to the main board. We have an integrated floppy drive controller and connector on the board. So we don't lose an additional card. There are some dip switches here that allows us to configure the memory 
the uh, floppy drive controller, stuff like that. Here we have our BASF MFM hard drive that produces this strange noise on boot up. Now this is your standard ST412 hard drive, 20 megabytes, 616 cylinders, 17 sectors and 4 heads. I think, but I'm not 100% sure, that European versions of this Commodore PC had these BASF hard drives. Now the PC itself works great, except for this hard drive issue. When applying power you hear this awful noise. So this is a seek error and the drive basically shuts off to protect itself. Now this only happens during a cold start. Once the drive has been warmed up, uh, starting the drive doesn't cause any issue at all. The ticking sound has completely disappeared and the seek just happens as it would on any other hard drive. So yeah, I'm not really sure if this is something that we will be able to fix, but I will definitely look into it. But for now the computer is perfectly able to see the drive, we can see the partitions, uh, we can read off the drive, everything seems to work fine, so yeah, I'm going to be addressing this at a later stage. Here we have the 1.2 megabyte 5 and a quarter inch floppy drive. So it's nice that it's a 1.2 uh, megabyte. Because a lot of these XT clones only came with 360 kilobytes of floppy drive. So the drive works uh, really well. I uh, haven't found any issues with it. Here we have the notorious power supply with the failed power switch and the fan that is not working at the moment. So I will be fixing that, both the switch and the fan, so that we have it completely uh, back into its original state with working fan and a working switch. Now on the back of the computer it said 170 watt but on the power supply itself it only specifies 120 watt which is strange. So here we have the ATI video card. So this one uses the 16800 chipset. It supports both uh, Hercules CGA, MDA on a variety of monitors. So you can actually hook this up to an EGA monitor as well. It can be controlled using these dip switches and it has the traditional two row D sub connector. It also has a composite output using these headers on the video card itself if you want to do like composite out of this video card. Next up is the hard drive controller card, which is a Western digital uh, controller. Now, these types of controllers, depending on the BIOS that they are uh, carrying, uh, can either configure a large number of hard drives or it can support a fixed number of hard drives, which is configured using uh, jumpers, which is the case on this board. So this controller supports 10 megabyte and 20 megabyte hard drives, and they need to be configured using these jumpers here. And depending on the BIOS, which is added to this controller card, you can configure various hard drives for it. On this controller card, we have the 4213 BIOS ROM, so that means that we can configure four different hard drive types, albeit only 10 or 20 megabyte hard drives. With the newer 4310 BIOS ROM, you can remove all of the jumpers on the controller card and you can do the configuration entirely through software, typically when performing a low level format of the drive. Other BIOS ROM revisions might have different jumper settings, so make sure to check the documentation of the controller card. Now these Western Digital controller cards are some of the best controller cards to have as they have a lot of support and a lot of online documentation. And here we have our memory expansion card that carries an additional 384 kilobytes of memory, bringing up the total of the machine to 640 kilobytes. So this uses a proprietary Commodore connector that attaches itself to the main board so it doesn't take up an ISA slot. And on the board itself you find different chips. We have eight 
chips 256 K making up 256 kilobytes and then we have two banks of 64 kilobytes each with an additional parity chip bringing up the total to 640 kilobytes of RAM if you take into account the 256 which is already on the main board now I did notice after using the floppy drive for a while that my floppies were getting somewhat damaged so here you can see that something has scratched along the magnetic surface of the floppy drive. So I went ahead and cleaned up the heads on both sides and the problem just went away from there. Now to clean the case it's fairly simple to remove the front cover of the case. All it takes is to remove these three screws here on the inside of the case to get the plastic bezel off. And then it will just slide out. So as you can see it's pretty dirty so we're going to give this a good cleaning. I'm also going to be removing the front cover of this floppy drive. So this is held down by these two screws here at the bottom. But you do also need to remove the handle of the floppy drive. Otherwise you can't get this thing off. Now the handle is put in place with this uh, metal ring here. So we'll just slide it off so that we can get the handle off. So by gently pulling on the handle, it will slide off the metal rod thing and we can give it a separate good cleaning. So here I'm just filling it up with some water and just a tiny bit of uh, detergent. Now I like to use this cream thing that my wife uses in the bathroom. It's called SIF here in Europe. I think it's called JIF in Australia and the US. It's a household cleaning thing that uh, does the job nicely on uh, plastic. It doesn't really damage them, but it gets the job done. Now for the front panel, I'm using the same cream. So I'm just gonna put it on here and use my brush to cover the whole surface just to give it a nice clean to get the stains off now this is not my favorite activity when it comes to retro computing but it is a necessary evil it is something that you need to do uh, if you want to keep your machines tidy neat and clean it also gets some of the smell off that these these old computers typically emit <laughs> So yeah, using a toothbrush to go over the, the nooks and crannies. And we can just leave it out in the sun to, to dry it off. And as you can see, it already looks a lot better. Now, all in all, I'm pretty happy with this PC. I like the fact that it's a Commodore. It won't win any beauty prizes, but Commodore remains this iconic brand that I have fond memories of when playing with the Commodore and the Amiga. I didn't actually know that they made PCs up until recently and I was pretty lucky to have found uh, someone who was able to sell it to me. So once it's cleaned up, I think it's really nice once the hard drive is warmed up, it is actually possible to boot from the hard drive. There was some software on it that I need to explore. So yeah, all in all, I think a pretty good find. Still some work to do, I need to look at the power toggle, I need to look at the power supply fan. And I also desperately need to look at that hard drive knocking, which is driving me crazy. But all of that will make up for a nice follow-up video. So I hope you all enjoyed this one. If you like it, please give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to support the channel. And I'll see you guys soon on a next video. Bye-bye.